This is the Lydian Spin with Liddy Lunch and Tim Dahl, episode number 74. How you doing, uh, Timothy Seymour Dahl? I'm okay. I'm out in um, Montauk for a couple of days. And uh, I was going to go, I was planning this week to go up to Massachusetts to see my mom and stepdad. But now with all the uh, state travel restrictions, it just became a much bigger uh, the only time more involved. In the only time I was in the only time I was in Montauk was in, I would imagine, 1978 when I ran into literally he almost ran into me a bicycle messenger, those blonde Greeks with green eyes who <laughs> suddenly just uh, suggested we go to Montauk for the weekend. And I have to say it was quite an adventure. I'm sure it was. Mondog's pretty cool. I've never been, I've never, I have been actually just to do like a gig, but I've never really stayed here during the peak season, which is 10 times the population, which right now it's, it's back, it's down to its normal uh, population of 3,500 year round residents. I it's went pretty- in the rainy season and I'm telling you, there were floods even inside the motel. Oh, anyway, well, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm I enjoying you- myself. Well, that's good. So I love this tag that uh, Jake Tapper from CNN, the gang that couldn't sue straight. Idiot, idiot, dummy, Donnie Trump. I hear we're close to 15%. That's the rate of COVID infection. I'm hearing that. And that's terrific. The ridiculous self-congratulatory nonsense of this idiot celebrating America's high coronavirus infection rate. Now, that's about one in every eight Americans, 15% of the nation is contracted COVID. More than 290,000 Americans have been killed. Cases are surging. 15 million Americans in the U.S. diagnosed. And the CDC months ago said it believes the real numbers could be absolutely 10 times higher. Now, in D.C., where, oh, during the next few weeks, there's going to be a bunch of super spreader events, you fucking idiots. 500,000 cases in D.C. alone since the start of the pandemic. Yes. And, you know, on the conservative end, there's, yeah, by inauguration, we're looking at basically 330,000, uh, 350,000 deaths. And, you know, for a novel virus to come in and within 10 months, you know, it's one out of a thousand people dying. Those aren't really, those aren't numbers if you're uh, in the industrialized world numbers you want to brag about it's how about, uh, how about the first guy in britain to get <laughs> the vaccine the 91 year old man called william shakespeare oh no no no. now this i'm glad you brought this up so it's 81 year old william oh, shakespeare and, and 90 year old margaret keenan lydia and i don't know if i ever told you the story i've met that guy what i i i have met that guy i'm 99 percent uh, sure so so so, so ch- check this out because he used to do always one of my stories not, not only does tim doll know everything he's been everywhere and met everyone it's amazing so, so so somewhere between like 2000 and 2003 i had to play a gig in coventry england where this williams bear shakes this williams william shakespeare is from the one that got the vaccine and it was in this theater warwickshire you know coventry where this guy everything where this guy's from and I, that was the joke. Our MC for the night was William Shakespeare, which is just down the road from where's it upon something upon Stratton or where, where's the real William Shakespeare from? But it's just down the road. So it's like, okay, I'm in the area of the real William Shakespeare. My MC for the night is named William Shakespeare. And I used to tell that story like once every couple of years, like, yeah, I was there. And I actually had a guy called William Shakespeare who was our MC, like, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Tim Dahl on bass, I'm William Shakespeare. And then like, sure enough, they're like Coventry, England, one of the first guys to get the vaccines, William Shakespeare. I was like, well, it has to be the same guy. And I looked at him, I was like, he looks familiar. Unless tons of people in that fucking town are named William Shakespeare. It just goes to prove your music gives life, doesn't take it away. Well, now, it, it, one, one, one more thing about the show, because I remember not every show and every event, but this was the other, this was the unfortunate side of that show. I, I was in, it was one of these like, Art center, like Warwickshire Art Center, big theater, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't see the audience. And I get this heckler who's like, rah, rah. Like, and I, I, I basically confronted. I was like, shut up, or some kind of like cool stage reaction to it. And then at that point, when the lights flashed on the audience, 
it turned out I was like a paraplegic in a wheelchair going like, oh, and I'm like, oh no, I look terrible. It was his, um, it was his form of actually <laughs> endorsing. He was into it, he was into it. And I was like, oh God, I, you know, I look terrible. But All anyway. right, okay, <laughs> anyway. Well, look, let's talk about that Trump sucker idiot, Ron DeSantis, who supposedly governs Florida. He just recently extended his order barring towns, cities, counties from enforcing local mask mandates even though it's an outrageous and catastrophic spike in COVID-19 cases in Florida. Oh, he terrible. extended an earlier order prohibiting, prohibiting localities from fining people who refuse to wear masks, effectively just rendering mandates unenforceable. Now, Florida, close to 1 million cases of COVID, 54,000 hospitalizations, more 18,000 deaths. And, you know, that's just going to rise because the amount of old people looking to get away from the cold. Okay, but then to top it off, this bootlicker Trump con had the nerve to send armed agents to the home of former state data scientist that's Rebecca so Jones. Awful. Now, she was absolutely responsible for trying to get the message out about how many cases in Florida there actually were. So they fired her because she was too uh, obstinate in wanting to reveal the facts. And, you know, they were trying to force her into manipulating the data so that they could carry on in their Trump-like method of serial killing a mass amount of fucking people because they're too stupid to wear a fucking mask. So they sent like a Gestapo, you know, a Gestapo team to her house, fully armed and loaded, knock on her door, guns raised, rifles. She tells them she has kids and a husband in the apartment. They don't fucking care. Confiscate her computer, her phone, which she uses now that she's been fired to try to update the population on just how much death disease, infection is going on in Florida and how little is fucking being done about it. Now, that's what goes on in Trump world. I saw the video of that, which was really disturbing. You know, get down here, kids. There's guns are all drawn. I mean, Florida was, it's been full of shit with this one since the beginning. And my, one of my good friend's dad was he retired living down there, died from it. And this is why I'm bringing this up, because he was retired from New York. If you're a snowbird, you know, meaning retire, you know, spend half the year there or your or your vacationing, which is basically half their fucking economy, and you die there and you're not from there, they don't count no, that they don't count it. as you well, dying there. It, it, and so it's the numbers are, could be twice as much. Well, Rebecca Jones said, look, despite the raid, she was not arrested or charged with a crime. And quote, this is what happens to scientists who do their job. Honestly, this is what happens to people who speak truth to power. She said the raid is not going to stop her and that DeSantis needs to worry less about what she's writing and more about the people who are sick and dying in this state. And basically, this is not going to stop her. Now, this reminds me of like Krebs, who was in charge of monitoring the election, said there was no fraudulence, there was no voter fraud, and then got fired by that idiot crybaby who's still in his fucking diapers throwing a fucking tantrum after he realizes he is not going to, by any means, throw this election over. When is he going to get a grip on this? I don't get it. And you know what? Mitch McConnell and the 88 other Republicans who won't admit to the crybaby to just fucking shut up and accept fact. I don't know what their fucking game plan is, but they really need to all be taken to task. Well, you know, well, as far as I'm concerned, let me just finish this. The whole fucking system should be thrown out and replaced with something that doesn't involve millionaires and billionaires, that doesn't involve vote buying. And it's funny, the ones that wanted to steal the election are crying that they didn't. The guilty are always suspicious. Well, yeah, exactly. So, so they're, they're actually... They're bad. What they're accusing, they're actually bad at. You know, if it is all corrupt, you know, they're not, well, then fine. But that's not even my point. Um, it seems like they just want to get revenge on being. They want revenge on to get revenge on others for themselves being wrong. Okay, I mean it's it's classic. It's stupid. And I mean, how many lawsuits? Shit. How many lawsuits do you have to fucking lose? And now that the Supreme Court even struck him down, you got no choice left. I mean, what do you expect? The Pope to come in? He ain't coming for you because he knows you're full of fucking shit. And by Literally, the way, they- but by the way, full of shit. What about that shit for brains, Rudy? I mean, oh, he's <laughs> doing fine. Yeah, right. Well, you know what? If we all had $100,000 to waste on medication, none of us would have COVID, you fucking cunt sucker. <laughs> Do you think this is, Lydia, do you think this is going to backfire? I mean, they're really just doubling down on just keeping the base 
Well, how is he going to for? How is he going to forward fire? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I'm, just, I'm talking about the the I'm talking about the Georgia uh, Senate runoff that's about to happen in in January, and and their base just want to get the base riled up and you know angry because they feel like they it's been yeah. stolen, but it could backfire yeah. if there's like you know for a thousand people dead you know? for a for a fucking lifelong criminal who not only stole everything or ripped every person off who's ever worked for him, has ripped off banks, has not paid his taxes, came into money, which he fucking lost. He's got a lot of damn nerve again, you know, trying to not only blame everybody else for his losses where he's finally getting busted. And, oh, I cannot wait, Southern District of New York. But on top of that, the the real piss off in all of this, of course, it's going to it already is backfiring. And he's too stubborn and stupid to realize it. Having no shame, I guess, does that. It's really Moscow Mitch McConnell that that crawls that crawls up my ass because in coming from a state like Kentucky that has a lot of poverty, as all states in this country have a lot of poverty and wanting to pass this covid relief bill, which basically relieves corporations from ever being. Uh, take it to court because people are dying because they're too stingy to give people masks and giving people there's going to be so many evictions so much starvation uh, where are all these people you know what all, everybody that loses their apartment their houses go camp out on the white house lawn but unfortunately the main assholes will not already be there so go camp out on mitch mcconnell's front lawn how about that well if homelessness goes up there's a problem because guess what else is going up trench fever which <laughs> they haven't seen since world war one in, in giant numbers which is basically the excrement of lice uh spreading it's, it's spreading mostly in the homeless populations but it's starting to spread particularly in the north right now they, they don't know why uh but so if homelessness goes up we might lice need love too <laughs> oh my god so uh, speaking of like airheads that live in outer space, um, the former Israeli space secretary chief. Oh, I uh, love, yeah, I Kime, love this. I, should, I love this. He, Go he's, ahead. Kime, he's basically saying, yes, ETs totally exist. Um, even Trump knows about it. And, and um, there's an he's actual- He's alien to reason. He's a fucking <laughs> alien to reason. Go ahead. These, well, there's, a, there's an actual galactic federation that's watching and this monitoring humans. They say we're not ready yet. And once we are, we might be allowed. I don't know if this guy, I, he's retired. If he's senile or if this is true, maybe. Living on a base underground in Mars. What people don't realize <laughs> is aliens are real. They're bacteria and they're viruses. They are on this planet. They're all over your body. They're in your fucking gut. Now they're in your nasal passages. They are mass murdering killers. You can't see them, but they look (laughs) really scary if you have a microscope strong enough to envision them. And there is nothing more terrifying than, and face it, most of what exists we can't see. So alien, alien, they're already inside you. We're just carriers. We're just carriers for the parasites that want to kill us. Sorry to say it, but I do love my body and all the parasites in it. And as I've said before, I may be a super spreader, but it's not of COVID. Well, you know, with all the things that want to kill us and that kill and, you know, there's what about when inanimate objects kill Uh, right now? Okay, Tim, are you? you, I know, you know, I'm a mind reader, but one of my favorite books is called The Secret Life of Inanimate Objects. I didn't know that was one of your favorite I, ha- I have it, and I'm going to show it to you when you well, come over next. I, you know, if I, if I was a TV, TV runner, producer, or whatever, you know, Fox used to have this thing called When Animals Attack about 20 years ago. And I wanted to do a spinoff called When Inanimate Objects Attack, like people caught up in folding chairs and all that stuff. But, you know, that will never happen. I don't have that job. But speaking I, of, I don't, of I don't know, I don't know why it reminded me of somebody just getting like a wedgie that is so paralyzing that they have to go to the <laughs> hospital. And once they try to remove the wedgie, they actually find a light bulb up there. I mean, I don't, what am I? I I'm oh. sorry. I got too, I got too much time on my mind. Well, speaking of an inanimate object that's looking to be quite deadly, mm. A68A, that's what it's referred to as. Uh, Uppercase A, 68, lowercase A, which is a ginormous iceberg um, oh. that is that it, it broken off of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula about two years ago. It was kind of hanging around. And for whatever reason, it just started launching in this direction. 
And Wait, which in which direction? Tim? Towards north, south. No, no, a little north on the Atlantic side. T- towards it's called South Georgia Island, which is the one of the biggest penguin colonies protected in the world, and it's gonna slam. It's just it's the same size as the island, so oh. it's about to go in that go into and slam into it. They're not just worried because you know things moving in slow motion. The penguins are gonna kind of run away, but they think all the scientists think it's gonna. Just kill all the life there. They're like they're gonna starve. They're just freaking out because they're like, are we intervening with nature? We don't know what to do. It's like a, as they say, like a train wreck in slow motion. You have this iceberg that this might just take out one of the biggest penguin colonies in the world. Right it's, now. it's 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 it, we're in a catastrophic state. And as an apocalyptician, I must say. None of this is new. It's all highly predictable. Most of these problems are man, M-A-N, made. And we are facing <laughs> the consequences now. And that's just the way it is. Now, Tim, when people ask me, what is my advice for oh, people who want to be musicians or artists? You know what yeah. I say. I say, <laughs> become a doctor, become a scientist, become a chemist. Yeah. We need better drugs. Okay. Uh, uh, obviously. Absolutely. I am so happy that Time Magazine, for the first time, named Kid, which is a female, of the year. 15-year-old scientist and inventor, uh, Ginajali Rao. At the age of 10, she discovered carbon nanotube sensor technology, Mm. which uses molecules to detect chemicals in water. And this was for Flint, Michigan. So a little device that actually could hook to your smartphone to find lead in water. At the age of 12, she earned the honor of America's top young scientist. Okay. And this, this device, it tests water faster than any other techniques currently in use. It's called Tethys. Okay. And it's portable, which is great. Three time Ted speaker. And in 2018 was awarded the U S environmental protection agency, presidential environmental youth award. Now her most recent project got to give her credit, is called Kindly. And it uses artificial intelligence to detect cyberbullying online oh, right, at right. an she early just... stage. 15-year-old. Uh, that one, that one jolly like round. as much. But well, you know one, what? I... I'm going to tell you why I like it. Please, please. Because you're not 15 years old. You're not 12 years old. I was. You, you, have, been, you have been bullied for shit. Like the name of one of your bands, every, and I don't every think fifteen, twelve year olds challenge at some point. But you know in, what? In a bullying environment. Yeah, they are. But you know what? It used to be a physical challenge. Now it's insidious, and the rate of suicide on young kids because of social media is is just it's it's too much. I think it's a very good device. Look, it's not like uh, banning shit, but I think let her keep going, please. Oh, we I, need more she's scientists. She's obviously a young inventor, maybe like a a new Ray Kurtz file, if you will. But but the thing is. Listen, the lead de- uh, detector in water. She could have right, taken Trump. Amazing. She could have amazing. taken. She could have taken Trump out four years ago with her cyberbullying device. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the cyberbullying. Oh, I'm Melania! How about Melania? Pro cyberbullying. I always, I always thought that was the way nerds could have uh, their revenge because they yeah. were teased on the, well, the physical, and now they're like Sarah and Joey suck or something. Yeah, like I know, the, but you know what? On- that, <laughs> that's why I do not partake. In social media, I do this. It goes online. I have Facebook. Somebody else runs it. I have Instagram. I'm not on there. I have never read anybody's Facebook because I would probably fucking hate your guts. And I don't need to have more hate. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I don't hate anybody. Now, I want to tell you about a little spasm Simon Slater had the other night at my house. Uh, Oh, okay. About the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, we brought over a full bottle of whiskey to my house, drank half of it. (laughs) Then he went into one of his Slater rants saying, I think the podcast is too much of a love fest. I think you have to get people on there you don't like. I said, Simon, I've brought (laughs) almost everyone to this fucking podcast. I'm known to hate. I'm paid to hate. I'm not paid to do this fucking podcast. If the intros aren't hateful enough, I'm like, first of all, who do I fucking hate? There were only two people I could think of. I'm not even mentioning their names. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not giving them any fucking credit. But Simon, in his slaterly way, had to go on about this for about a half an hour until finally I said, Simon, I've heard every fucking thing you've said. When you bring somebody on, I disagree with. It's not about disagreeing. You know what it's about? It's just about presenting people that have unique versions of their existence to people, whether they're filmmakers, musicians, composers, producers, photographers. I'm not looking to promote or get into arguments for free for people I don't have respect for. I'm here 
and we are to try to elevate and expose people to people they might not know that much about because there's a lot of fucking cool people out there to combat the mm-hmm. bullshit we deal with every fucking day. My hatred is much bigger than one individual. I don't care what they do. What do you think about that? I feel I'm being yeah, cyberbullied because cyber I barely bully, remember so. that. Co- I'm being cyberbullied because I don't barely yeah, remember that conversation. Because you were fucking drunk because you brought a wh- bottle of whiskey in my house. You drank half of it and yeah, for 30 <laughs> minutes ranted. And when I told you. Cyberbullying. Oh, no. We need kindly <laughs> were, right you now. You were bullied in person because after listening to you for 30 minutes, I'm like, Simon, I'm going to tell you exactly what you just said. And you were you agreed with me. I was right because I, as usual, was not drunk. L- 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 Lydia, do you do you like the Larry Clark movie Bully? Did you ever see that? I do like Larry Clark's movies because I think they really depict the horror of youth. Yeah, I, he's, I think he does a pretty good job. Ken Park, I'll watch. I saw that once. I don't think well, I like on the same subject. I would prefer Hard Candy <laughs> about a female baddie. But anyway, just saying. What else, Tim? What do you, All right, well. You know, we mean, have a very interesting guest tonight, so wrap this up. Got any animal story? What about the vulture well, descent? Well, oh, oh, I, I, should, I should talk about it. I mean, my animal story was the uh, iceberg collision with penguins. All right, well, what about uh, the I, vultures I, descending in a, in a small town in Pennsylvania just to drop their corpse-smelling poop for I mean, we can't I, figure out what reason? Vultures, condors, I, all that stuff. My buddy said he was on, or my brother was on a... Uh, work related trip somewhere in central america or something and they he and his colleague went out drinking heavily one night and the, i guess his colleague kind of passed out on his bed with his clothes on and woke up with his slide door patio about Whoa. six condors just at the window looking at him like he was like a corpse or about to wolf down so yeah i guess he got pretty tanked but uh yeah they have an eye for the uh, soon to become dead. Now, I think there's something something about the stench of drunk men that could definitely bring a condor oh, out. I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I'm I would. Sh- excuse me. I would say the stink of drunk men has had me bring condoms out. But uh, please, come on, that's uh-huh. ridiculous. Well, it usually does equal death, whether it's 20 years down the line or that <laughs> night. But uh, death is definitely the aroma, uh, no matter how no matter how you smell it. Now. <clears throat> This is uh, pretty dumb. Um, I guess it was announced yesterday uh, the 2024 Olympics in Paris will. Officially oh, I know, I know. Break dancing. Well, this is kind of perfect because it kind of leads up to our next guest. I mean, and you know, what about break breaking glasses or you know, I mean, just you know, well, I mean, all, all these all it's a these bit sports, old. I, I mean, I mean. I, I get it. The big, the big uh, TV ratings one is figure skating, but I just always have a hard time with these kind of interpretive sports. Like, you know what I'm a really big fan of? I mean, what about you? You but, get a point or Tim, I, I don't know. You know what I'm a really big fan of? What? I have to say, pole dancing on the subway by young urban youth when they oh, come in like thing. groups of three. It's, it's amazing. I have to say, I really, it's always joyous to me. I'll give them a dollar or two. I mean, pole dancing, but with young boys. Yeah, yo. Well, speaking of somebody who is a perpetual teenage boy and who does it by rebelling constantly with music, I mean, he actually even rebels with his own music against his previous type of music, is Bobby Gillespie um, of Primal Scream. What I love about Primal Scream, I, I love the album Exterminator, but they were so hated by the British press. Bobby started in, in the Jesus and Mary Chain and then formed Primal Scream. But every one of their albums contradicts each of the previous one, which is kind of how I view my musical schizophrenia. I'm very happy to present Bobby Gillespie of Primal Scream. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl and special guest, Bobby Gillespie. Bobby, we have some weird parallels. I'm going to start with the first. One of your first bands, Jesus and Mary Jane. My first band, Teenage Jesus. <laughs> That's a far We're, stretch, but okay. It's not at all, and it was around the same time. Uh, We're both, I consider us both musical schizophrenics, right? We both had a lot of animosity thrown at us for a lot of our early work. My God, they were fucking cruel to you. And then, you know, just like the British press, occasionally they start to love you. We both covered some Velvet Morning. 
Of course, I did it with Roland S. Howard and you did it with Kate Moss. I'm still waiting for her to just support the rest of our lives, but she hasn't heard me on that one. <laughs> and then we actually got to sing some Velvet Morning together at the Roland S. Howard tribute in February of 2020 before the COVID struck. We both recently, and what's strange is we were sitting backstage and I thought I had asked you about Franco Berardi. And I wrote or texted you the next day and you said, no, I didn't. But I was asked to do some poetry, to read some poetry of Franco Biffo Berardi on a, on a record. And you said he was one of your favorite philosophers. And then they asked you. And yeah. that just came out. Bobby, what's going on here? What, what is it with you and me? There's one thing that you've forgotten about or you don't know about. Tell me. One of your ex-boyfriends, Murray Mitchell. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Is married to one of my ex-girlfriends. Whoa, it's, that's heavy. <laughs> Bobby, it's like we're family, my friend. It's <laughs> freaking yeah. weird. And I just realized but, that tonight. And I'm still very good friends with Murray Mitchell. You still good friends with her? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Family reunion once COVID. Well, if you're if person. you're if you're spiritually connected here, when did you guys meet each other in the physical world? How did that happen? I remember. I think it was a uh, grinder man. It was it was it was standing on stage at in Barcelona yeah. at a grinder man concert, and I was with Debbie Harry. Really? And, what year was that? Who God knows. Okay. <laughs> I think it was two thousand, maybe a nine or something. Two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand nine. Not that long ago. My yeah. time flies. Time flies when you look this good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but Bobby, you are a musical schizophrenic. And by the way, Exterminator, one of my favorite things that you've done. But what's interesting is almost with every album, you're recreating a new concept or a new sound. And it's kind of what I've done also. And this has been going on for years with you. We're not stopping, are we? Uh, no, not not at all. Do you think you've you're in your peak now? Do you think, especially with the musicians, as you've you know as you've transcended from, you've still worked with some of the same people, but are you with the sound you really have always wanted to get? With uh, was your last album called what was it? Chaos. Osmosis. <laughs> there, <laughs> you hit it. You hit it on the head. Uh, well, with that record, uh, whoa, it's a kind of strange record. It's kind of got a partner that I write with us, Andrew Innes, guitar player. He's been in the band since since the first album. He's a very talented man. From the late 90s until the last album, he's, he's engineered most of the records, apart from a couple. He's very good uh, with synthesizers, drum machines. And then in the last album, he was using a lot of plugins, plugin synthesizer sounds. So a lot of the songs were kind of written from these synthesizer beds of kind of like electronic kind of pop riffs, and that's how that's how it came into being. And um, and we also the thing we always did was to try and uh, marry like electronics and synthesizers with like hard you know hard rock musicians punk bass, post-punk bass, you know, with rock and roll guitars and uh, try and uh, marry both types of music, I guess. And um, also using interesting samples occasionally of yeah, like, yeah. just little spoken word clips, which uh, yeah. you, you started doing that pretty early on. And we did, yeah. which we did, we oh, did, I want to... We used a, a, we used a bit of Clockwork Orange on our second single, the B-side of the second single, you know, a little piece of Malcolm McDowell saying, uh, it's funny how the colours of the real world only look like really real when you video them on a screen, you know? And in those days, we never had a sampler. We just took the fucking uh, VHS mm -hmm. bootleg video and a fucking video recorder into the studio and just put it up on a TV screen, you know, press play at the right time and then taped it from a little cassette recorder and... Uh, you know, it was all kind of done very manually, and uh, but 
Yeah, we've always uh, liked to use dialogue from films, mm-hmm. Vanishing Point. Uh, well, let's talk about that for a minute, because yeah. a lot of your lyrics on Vanishing Point, which was one of your early albums, you, you say it's basically based on this film, which is pretty much an incredible cult movie. Tell us yeah. just a little bit about the film and, and also like the album in, in conjunction with it. And I love the fact that, you know, I know you're interested not only by film, but by writers. We're going to get into that in a minute. So tell, oh. tell us a little about The Vanishing Point. Well, the Vanishing Point uh, record, we had this song called Kowalski. I mean, what I was trying to do was we, we Andrew had this uh, really great uh, drum loop and just some noises, kind of wind noises, electronic wind noises. It was an atmosphere. The album before, which was called Give Up, It Don't Give Up, we'd recorded in Memphis with Tom Dowd, who produced Aretha Franklin, John Coltrane, Impressive. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you must, that, you know, unbelievable. Unbelievable, man. Uh, he also, at the age of 16, was working on a Manhattan project. Oh, right. I read about that. Yeah. 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 And he invented eight track recording. He, uh, he was like a boy genius, you know, but then even in rock and roll, he was Atlantic Records house producer. So we, we worked with him in like 1993 and we went to Muscle Shows. Uh, worked with the Muscle Show Rhythm Section. We actually recorded at Arden Studios in Memphis with Tom. The songs for that album were kind of written around, you know, in a traditional way with guitar riffs, first chorus, first chorus, middle eight, guitar solo, coda, you know, classic rock, pop, soul, song construction, which we love, which I love. But for the album after that, we kind of lost a guitar player. He was still in the band, but he... Kind of, he was MIA. He was uh, he had a lot of fucking addiction problems, uh, and he uh, he kind of disappeared for a year or two. So we were lost with that his kind of bluesy, dirty, filthy guitar riffs. So we made a different type of album, and that that was Vanishing Point. So we instead of writing to guitar chords or piano chords, you know, uh, chord sequences, we began writing to uh, atmospheres and grooves with no chords. I call, it, thought, psych, I call it I call it psychoambience. Yeah, it's like most, you started with the basis of like psychoambience with these uh, yeah, sounds, otherworldly sounds. Yeah, that's uh, and then the last thing to put on was the bass, you know, or even some chords, you know, from a, like a you know electric piano or a piano or a synth. You know, it was generally most of the songs were written to rhythm and atmosphere. And we had this song where I sang, I'm like Kowalski and Vanishing Point, Kowalski and Vanishing Point, because I heard some of the rappers saying, you know, I'm like Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry, <laughs> you know, they would reference films and make mm-hmm. himself the bad guy in the film, you know, or I'm like I'm Dracula, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> you know, I'm going to bite you. And I uh, sink my teeth into your neck. I don't know, I'm just like Marky Smith. But, you know, they were referencing guys in films, <laughs> yeah. right? They were referencing, you know, characters in films. And so we were speed freaks, basically, and... I just started saying I'm like Kowalski and Vanishing Point. You know, it was a kind of paranoid speed freak kind of track. And so Andrew and myself were both big fans of the, the film Vanishing Point. We had um, recorded a lot of the dialogue from the film and intended to, we sampled it and intended to use it to, to begin the track. So when we did, we did interviews for that album, I would say, oh, I would just make this story up, right? The, the album was based on the film, but it wasn't, you know, it was just, um, we were looking for an album title and Andrew suggested Vanishing Point. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good title. You know, you can read a lot, of, a lot of different things into that, you know, and... Um, what other films of that period were really kind of inspiring you at that time? I mean, because sometimes, you know, look, we write lyrics, we got to consume films, we got to consume books, we got to get some from inspiration for stuff and vanish the vanishing point is like 71 i think yeah sarif and richard sarif and 71 late i mean on the next album exterminator we sampled linda mans from dennis hopper's out of the blue mm. the you know films that are an f the film f by lindsay anderson uh english director he uh, have you ever seen that film he may, if uh, if Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that film. No, I haven't. No. What year is that? That's also the 70s, isn't it? 1968. He made it during yeah. the, the revolutionary year of 1968. And he, uh, he, uh, he got to public school in the 40s or 50s and had a terrible time. And he went to the headmaster and he said, I've got this idea to make a film. And he gave the headmaster 
this film script, which was a completely different film script. The headmaster said, yeah, you can shoot in the film, you can shoot in the school during the school oh, holidays. I, I do remember, I do remember this film. Yeah, so he made yeah. the film and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, he absolutely attacks the English public school system and the uh, British class uh, system. Malcolm McDowell, who later went on his star in Clockwork Orange, this mm -hmm. film made him a star. Yeah. And he plays yeah. this revolutionary schoolboy who is amoral and fucking incredible. It's the very first Primal Scream. My very first gig for Primal Scream, singing and playing drums for Jesus and the Mary Chain, I designed a poster and the poster was F. It was the hand grenade with Malcolm <laughs> McDowell, just the public school boy, then as a, a revolutionary, you know, with a, <laughs> taught the submachine gun. And um, mm. and that was the the poster that we used. And with Jesus and Mary Chain, Prime will scream, Biff Bang Pow, Ochre Five, and the bottom of it, it says, which side are you on? Nice. You know? But so, Bobby, do you know the film, do you know the film Privilege? Yes. The British film. You know, it's, yeah, it's us. Privilege is amazing. It's very hard to find. And I saw it on late night TV when I was about 13, 14. It would play after like rock concerts that had the New York Dolls, Mop the Hoople, et cetera. And I've been looking for a copy ever since. And that was a pretty radical film about a rock star who's really popular, but then the government turns against him and his fans turned against him. There's he's dragged off stage in handcuffs. I think Gene Shrimpton is in it as well. It's a really interesting kind of a, not in the same vibe as if, but it reminds me of that period of yes. clockwork orange privilege, very political big brother is coming George Orwellian in a sense. Yeah. Peter Watkins. He also made a film called punishment park set. Have you seen that one? I'm going to check that, that one out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, well, it's the late sixties, and the government take all these like American hippies to the desert. The uh, it's like a kind of concentration camp for radical hippies. And he also made a film called Culloden, which was about the massacre uh, of Bonnie Prince Charlie's uh, Jacobean army at the hands of the English in seventeen forty five. But it may have been an allegory for what was happening in Vietnam. It was made for the BBC. He was a, an interesting guy, actually, Watkins. His films, if you go on the BFI website, British Film Institute website. Must uh, investigate. So, Bobby. Oh, John, Manfred Mann plays the lead character. <laughs> go ahead, Tim. Uh, so, the yeah. question is, you know, back in the day, well, especially early 90s, it's a different time. People, bands had budgets. Uh, so they had time to really rehearse and develop things. Were you writing in the studio? Like when your guitarist left, were you sitting there in the studio or were you in your own rehearsal area developing these things? Were you doing it? Oh, no, no. Uh, okay, early 90s. Uh, 1990, we had a hit single. Yes, the, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, hang on a second. How did that feel, Bobby, after having a lot of slag-offs in the British press? Suddenly, what was that hit single? And did you say, about fucking time, motherfuckers? Or were you kind of like, <laughs> kind of shocked? It, no, no, no. It was delicious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, did, did you feel strange? Because you had left the Jesus and the Mary Chain, and then they became really big. And then... Hey, no, and they then, were big when I left them. When I yeah, left they, them... They were, they were, they were, they were big, left, but, but... Go ahead. Yeah, but I left them uh, just, as, just after they released Cycle Candy. Oh, okay, okay. And, yeah, and then Prime was screaming to cut. That was 86, uh, early 86. And then I think... Primal Scream, we kept going for a few years after that, and um, we'd released two albums, and then we had this song, Loaded, that was a massive hit, and then the money that we made from Loaded, uh, what, what happened was we were sent this label, Creation Records, and uh, Alan McGee, uh, who had also managed the Jesus and Mary Chain, he managed to get us a publishing advance, and he managed to get some money from somewhere and put us on a wage. We were kind of signing on the dole, right? Uh, we had unemployment benefits, right? <laughs> and um, McGee put us on a, a wage of like 60 quid a week or something. And he gave us a, little, a, few th a couple of thousand pounds and we built this tiny studio on an industrial estate beside a council estate in Hackney back in the day when no one wanted to go oh. to Hackney. Ha Hackney, was, then, yes. Hackney, Hackney, was, Hackney was hell. <laughs> right, and it's just just there on the corner from where Genesis P. Orridge lived. I didn't know he lived there at that point, right. but Alan's office, uh, Alan's uh, company, record company office, was a street away, and it was above an Asian sweatshop where these Asian women fucking, you know, yep. 
got a few in my neighborhood now, but yeah, and then yeah, it's a shit, yeah, it's a glitzy and yeah, it's very glamorous now. But and then we had a studio across the road uh, in the where was it again? Tudor Road, it was called, and it was a small industrial estate, and we rented a room there and we built a studio and we soundproofed it. We got an S one thousand, Aka S one thousand, the sampler. We did little keyboards. We had a little uh, vocal booth made, and then we wrote the Screamadelica album in there. So and then yeah, so we actually had a little studio that we could go to and write and sample stuff. It was at the beginning of sampling. Right. S one thousand sampler uh, came out was released uh, in nineteen eighty nine. So we had one in nineteen ninety. Yeah. And so we began making. Uh, writing the songs for the album that was the Schemadelic album which was released 1991 then summer 1990 we had another hit called Come Together and uh, that got even higher in the charts so we you know we we two hit singles we were and yeah I enjoyed the I enjoyed the success and I enjoyed <laughs> the music papers uh, getting on their knees you know and uh, trying to suck us off you know? <laughs> so, 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 ba- so basically you, you'd have you'd have <laughs> I always knew we were great, you know. And um, <laughs> after years of derision, you just go, "I'm gonna." No, because you did, yeah. hey, Bobby. Bobby, you did your fucking days, my friend, because they came with daggers. Often, the British press was oh, fucking evil. ruthless back evil. in those days. Ru- evil. Ruthless, evil. ruthless, and and you did your fucking due diligence, and then you had a couple of hits. So now, what happens? Now you're playing. What about the Glastonbury? I love this. What about, ex- I think it was Exterminator at Glastonbury and they like cut you off because you were going over the uh, time limit and well, that, maybe. That was a few years later. That was, uh, I think that was 2005, I think. Okay, so was it, so was it Scream Adelic that kind of no, really was, put you on the charts? No, no. Put you well, on the charts? No, uh, Scream Adelic, yeah. Uh, Scream Adelic was like a top 10 album. Uh, What'd you buy? What'd you buy with all your money? Uh, I was still living in a basement flat in Brighton, and um, <laughs> oh boy! And then I was just walking about with huge checks in my pocket, uh, holes in my trousers and my arse. Wouldn't wash my hair for months. Filthy leather jacket. Uh, I tried to hail a taxi, and the taxi drivers wouldn't pick me up. They thought obviously I was like too poor to pay the fare, but I had a check for fucking a lot of money in my pocket. What did I do? I never really. I just stayed in a little kind of basement flat. Some of the guys started buying flats, and I never, I never did that until a lot later. And um, were you buying? Were you buying a lot of drugs, Bobby? Yeah, we were buying. A lot of drugs. <laughs> what 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 drugs were those? <laughs> well, for me, uh, amphetamines, guitar player, cocaine. <laughs> then it, you got on the list. <laughs> Well, I like I like speed. Acid came in then. No, we were doing acid earlier than that. But and <laughs> then it kind of fast forwarded and it like one of the guys in the band was buying big amounts, shall we say? Okay. And um, mm. you know, away. way more than <laughs> the heroin came in. Oh, and, uh, ah. You know, there was um, we did a lot of good stuff. And you know, we made Screamadelica. We went to Memphis. We made Give Up, but don't give up with Tom Dowd. And the Muscle Shows Rhythm section, and we uh, we had more hits. We had another hit song called Rocks. We had an album called Give It But Don't Give Up, which sold I think nine hundred thousand copies. <laughs> and Bobby, are you, Bob, Bobby, yeah, are you mar- are you married? You are. Are you polyg- <laughs> Are you po- are you polygamous? <laughs> well, the thing is, we can't get it. but this was a long time ago, right? It's just like early. This is the mid nineties, right? Yeah, what happened? I, I, was, <laughs> it was, but you might sell nine hundred thousand copies, but you've spent eight hundred thousand right. pounds right, right. making. You know, you've made hundreds of thousands of. You've spent hundreds of thousand pounds on videos, working with the session musicians, paying the producer. We didn't give a fuck because, you know, I was getting whatever. You know, hunt. You know, ninety quid a week, eighty quid a week. I had a good publishing deal. I had. You know, it's free. You know, we but, were but, but, wait, hang on. Yeah, but that's really important for people to like, know. It yeah. sounds like we were making a lot of bread, right? And for guys in the late twenties, we were. But but the thing was, we are working class guys. We weren't millionaires or anything like that. You know, it was we had money, but it was um, in Britain. You know, you get taxed fifty percent. It's gone. 
And then, you know, you were paying the manager, you were paying the agent, and there was, we were doing good, right? For working. You were doing, you were doing good for yourself, but that's what people really need to realize. To need to realize is that just because you might be in some people's eyes a big rock star selling a lot of records doesn't mean you're making money off of that. And maybe it's the live shows that are actually paying your rent, but people don't really they think I'm a rich rock star. Give me a fucking break, yeah. you know. And you're not. I mean, people don't understand the the dichotomy between what your what your public presence might be, how many records you sold or didn't. And really, what's in your bank account? Well, we were going on tour, and we had eighteen people on, on tour. You know, we had like a like a eight yeah. or nine piece band, right? Plus nine, you know, like huge overhead, right? And at the time, I never thought anything of it. I just thought, hey, the band's shit hot, the crew are good guys. They they party and get high with us. Some of them have worked for New Order, Public Image, you know, um, Susie and Banshees, like Murray. You know, we were a big gang going around the world having a good fucking time. And uh, I never thought where the money was going. Did you? <laughs> question. What about merch? When you're when you're playing giant. Well, we were never a big merch band. <laughs> you weren't. Because that's where you could make no. that, uh, make the the unchecked money. Point, I've got, uh, no, we, I don't think we were ever a big merch band. You know, it was like, we were just, we, listen, we, we did okay. You know, it was like, I had enough money to live on. And I, I was secure and I felt good and I felt the band were making good work. And that's the important thing. But look, people don't realize that Alice Cooper was touring in a station wagon for a lot of oh, his yeah. career or that the, the Who never made any money for absolute years. George people Clinton don't. lived in a dumpster for a month while he was famous. <laughs> hey, Is Sly and the... George Clinton <laughs> lived in a, basically in a dumpster for a month yeah. in the late 70s. All right, no, George, we worked with George. We made records with George. We played oh, cool. games with George. Oh, cool. George is our friend, you know. Oh, Beautiful. Beautiful. And um, what a what a, what a mind! Asking, what a musical mind! Well, I remember asking George. I said, uh, "This is the nine ninety three or something ninety four, and I was like, "We're doing an MTV in New York or some TV thing in New York." And George was going to get up and sing with us, and I was like, "What? Well, how's Sly? Have you seen Sly?" Mm. And he's saying, um, "Oh no, <laughs> he's, you know, Sly lives in a fucking caravan." Oh know? yes, <laughs> oh yes. You know, that's that, so, that's 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 that is really that is the you know, story of rock and roll. Unless you know, you're absolutely the top ten forever, it's like it is what happens. You know, it's well, what some morons. You know, I always wonder about this because some some like real brilliant people end up penniless in the street. And then you get the Motley Crue guys, for whatever reason, <laughs> people took care of them and they all have like 80 million. It's like, how do those guys come out ahead? I, <laughs> I don't know. So, so question, question, question. West Coast speed, uh, uh, Br British speed, German, Berlin speed, Japanese speed, Australian speed. Do you have a uh, preference of those? Uh, I, I, I've taken them all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, what well, uh, the the east, the west coast, you know, methamphetamine in America is pretty, oh, pretty that's, fucking yeah. strong, right? I oh, think yeah, that's very strong. in New York it was mainly cocaine or heroin. We had well, you know, because yeah. between DC yeah. and Boston, that's the mafia has got that line, so it's gonna, it's, it's they're yeah. cocaine, yeah, so it's not, yeah. It's, but we, it's, yeah. Okay, but I, I, I want I want to address this for a minute because I think it's very important. It's that, you know, some sometimes drugs used correctly, correctly, and for the right amount of time, can accelerate the imagination. Absolutely. It's that when drugs stop doing what they originally did, and you're constantly looking for what they once did but they no longer do, that you start having That's a true. fucking problem. You know, people always complain about athletes using performance enhancing drugs. I'm like, why not? Musicians do it all the fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> but there does but there does come a point, right, Bobby, where it's like, you know what? Enough is fucking enough because also you gotta be concerned about your just physical health. Yeah. And and it just becomes it becomes trite and boring after a while. I mean, I'm too fickle. It's like that again. Ugh, please. I mean, I could talk for hours about the the problems in uh, our band with, with drugs and, you know, and like we had one member who really got taken at hard, you know, and um, 
for a number of years and creatively it killed him, you know? And he um yeah. he was like so talented as an um naturally talented guitarist and he never he could never pace himself. You know, he was always I do also think that there is in some people an addiction gene yeah. that it just they have to be all or nothing and they have to be nothing because uh, because there just is. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it a million times. For some people, you can do, you know, I could take speed every day for like six weeks and then I'd be like, you know what, I've got I'm done. Right. I'm done. And I would just have to yeah. stop. Whereas my friend was just, you know, and he also when he was taking drugs, it was oblivion. You know, it was oblivion, you know? Oblivion. It was oblivion, and so yeah. You know, and yeah. there was deeper, deeper issues there as well. Well, you know, in general, I always say, do as much alcohol and drugs as you possibly can without ruining your life. Well, <laughs> and, and, you, and, and, that, and, that, and that margin, that gauge is different for everyone. Some people can just get really fucked up one night and that fucked them up. They did something terrible. Some people can keep it steady. I mean, it's just, but it's hard to see it. It's hard to have self reflection. I, I think the issue is this. They could make really perfect drugs. Like a really perfect <laughs> ecstasy. I would call it M-A-D-M-A. That's the drug I'm on all the time, MADMA, because adrenaline is my favorite drug. I'm not even going to, I'm just going to whisper it to myself and a bit of cock sucking, but I'm not going to say that. I'm adrenaline is my drug. They could make a perfect morphine that wasn't really addictive, not the opiates they make I'm now. Not sure about they that. could make, yes, they could. Okay. And they could make, I mean, this. Not all drugs are addictive and they could make better. This is why I say don't go into music, kids or art. Go into chemistry. We need more and better <laughs> drugs that are not addictive. Go ahead. What was it like growing up in Glasgow as a wee, as a wee boy? Uh, I grew up in a, a district called Springburn on the north side of the city, which was uh, tenements like they have in New York. And there, was, there had been a locomotive factory at the bottom of my street. So I'm guessing that the, the tenements have been built to house the workers that worked in that factory back in the 19th century or early 20th century. And I think that at one point during the British Empire, 25% of all locomotives in the world were built in that district. But, you know, I enjoyed living there uh, as a kid. I like my parents, my brother, we, had two, we lived in two rooms. The first place I lived in, there was my parents and me in a single room. There was no toilet or bath that was outside in the land and outside. Brutal. And then the second uh, place we lived was downstairs and that was two rooms. And then my brother came along. So there was four of us in one room, you know. The whole area was con uh, condemned. So it was like a, a an apocalyptic scene. That's what I grew up on. Yep. This was... But this was incredible from my imagination. Because, you know, I thought it was in some fucking war movie every day. You know, Commando. Um, we went these, we raided these empty houses. We could, we could go to the loft at the top of the street and work our way down to the, the houses at the bottom of the street. It had a big impact on my imagination, going into these empty flats. Because, you know, people had left their tables, their chairs, toys, you know, pictures on the wall, like they were fleeing an enemy army. The emptiness, I remember it being a thriving community, Springer, being a wonderful place. I think there was a lot of work, kids, just kids playing in the street and, you know. Bobby, growing you know. up in an apocalyptic setting, I grew up race riots in front of my house at six and eight. It's like being in a war zone. That's how I yeah. compare it to two. But it did somehow flavor or educate us. Yeah. With me, it educated me with the music and also the sense of protest because the race rats were right in front of my house at six mm. and eight. You yeah. saw the devastation of poverty and the apocalyptic yeah. landscape. And in a sense, it did educate us. It did flavor us. And you did start becoming, I mean, you became politically aware very early because you lived in a p political war zone of poverty. Yeah, that's true. My dad is a Marxist. He's been involved in like the left-wing politics all his life. 
Like, you know, we grew up with a picture of Che Guevara on one wall <laughs> and uh, the three American athletes doing the power salute at the Mexico at the 60 Olympics on another wall and uh, stuff like that, you know. And I, I, I remember saying to my dad, what are those guys doing? Like Tommy Smith and that, doing mm-hmm. the power salute. And he explained to me, he said, I was like seven or six or something. And he goes, you know, in their country, in America, their children can't go to the same school as a white cat. And they can't sit at the same lunch counter as a white man. And they can't even stay in the same hotels as white people. And then I was like, hey, that's wrong. You know, he explained it in a really cool way for a little kid. So that uh, hatred of fucking uh, inequality and racism was just, it's, it's always been there for myself and my brother, you know. And also empathy for underprivileged people because that's my background. <laughs> it's, it's what you we know? are. It's yeah. what we were. Well, we are. We're working yeah. class. I'm proud to be working class. It's very much shaped my outlook. Who are some of your favorite writers or philosophers that were, you know, helping you just get on with life as a, as a young teenager? And great to have a father who already knows what bullshit most reality is, especially the American and British way of life. My dad, uh, he had bookshelves full of books. My dad, you know, he had a pretty troubled upbringing and um, never received much of an education. But through left-wing politics back in the day, they really encouraged people to be autodidacts and uh, educate themselves. So he was reading Marx. You know, the trade unions would have like book clubs where the workers could educate themselves. My dad um, worked in a, a book binding factory, so he managed to get a lot of books. And he had... Stuff like uh, you had Henry Miller and stuff like that. I remember oh, looking. Excuse, at like, hang on, right there, because you know it's one of my favorite right. authors. Is Henry Tropic Miller. of Cancer. I've never read it, but he definitely had that. Uh, Tropic of whole, Capricorn. Yep. A Capricorn. I sorry, so I'm Cancer, right? But but both, both, st- both. Yeah, and he also had you know the English classics like Jane Austen, and Dickens, and all the kind of stuff like that. Was you know uh, Robert Louis Stevenson? You know, he, I remember he had the American. The Book of American Folk Music, which I used to look through, and I had the Ballad of Jesse James, you know, the Ballad of Joe Hill. I, I dreamt I saw Joe Hill last night. What sorts of stuff like that? And so he had a varied selection of stuff, and he used to encourage me to read. But I never really picked up reading until I was like 18, 19, and then just getting into stuff like Burroughs and fucking um, George Orwell, and, you know, like a, stuff like Clockwork Orange, and um, just kind of basic stuff like that, you know, and then J.G. Ballard, you know. How are you dealing with the quarantine, Bobby? Well, I'm fine, you know. I'm, I've got a nice house here in London, and um, I just stick. I, I just keep to my area. Yeah. You know, it's cool. You know, that's I've got a, a routine that I stick to, and, I, and I'm happy. And occasionally, I walk, take my dog to the park in the weekend. That's I'm happy, I, you know. I, and then I've got a friend who's got a really cool record store, and sometimes I go and visit him and uh, <laughs> pick up some good records. And um, yeah. It, that's, that's all I need, you know. All right, what are you listening to lately, Bobby? What's what's on your turntable? What what's driving your hip? What's driving your hips crazy or your mind lucid? Well, I listened to uh, Tom Petty's Wildflowers album the other night that he made with Rick Rubin. I bought a copy of that and I, I was listening to that uh, two nights ago. Yeah, and last night I listened to I, I got a see. I'm like, yeah, I went to this record store actually yesterday, and. Um, Got some cheap CDs, and one of them was the Zombies A's and B songs. All right, Santana's version. Never heard of it. She, of she's not there. You've heard it, Bobby. It's fucking amazing. What year was that? I know, I know. What year was that? Like ask, early, early, early Santana's. Nineteen seventy-seven. Okay, okay. It's hey, amazing. Uh, living in Glasgow now. This is our little cliche. This is something that a stereotype that we, at least I, I always thought when I go there. Actually, even hanging there on a Friday night. People like to fight there. You know, they get drunk and they, they fight a lot. I mean, did you have to learn how to fight growing up? Uh, I learned how to make friends with guys that could fight. <laughs> that's that's smart. And um, that's, why learned... you like, that's why you like me, Bobby, because you know I could kill anybody with a truck <laughs> punch and I would protect you. And uh, thank you, Lydia. And I, um, <laughs> yeah, and I just, you know, you just work it out, don't you? Yeah, you, do. you work at what you know, what kind of people to stay away from, and um, <laughs> and to to give respect to, and yeah. uh, for some reason, tough heart, the, the guys that could fight at school always seemed to like me, so yeah. I was all right, you know. 
Humor helps. Right. Humor, humor can really settle a lot of violence. I mean, that's oh, what yes. I learned yeah. on the streets of New York is like, I couldn't take on and, you know, I couldn't pull a fucking cautious clay on everybody, but I could certainly pull a George Carlin on most people and it would just <laughs> blind them to my science and I'd be up the street and they'd be laughing. Up to a certain age, when any of the challenges to a fight, you fight them. And then you get to a certain age, you go to the big school and you realize everybody's a lot bigger than me. So <laughs> I, I don't think I'll be taking on too many fights here. Um, I have to, you have to have a different strategy. Well, as I like to say, Bobby, if you want to fight or you want to fuck, either way, you're going to get fucking hurt. But that, that usually, <laughs> after that, I don't know, that's just one yeah. of my mottos, you know, come on. Uh, yeah, I, I've, just, I've been able to get us to our face mostly, you know. What about being politically incorrect? Like, so you, you guys and uh, Stockhausen both had the unfortunate timing uh, during, during the 9-11 attacks to... Well, Stockhausen said something very different than what, and his was after yours, but your, your thing about bomb the Pentagon, that didn't really, people weren't very happy about that with it. Was it, maybe it was an intuitive prediction or something. Cause that, you said that, be, you did that before it happened, right? A couple of weeks before. Uh, I think I'd written up uh, in 1999, I think. Oh, it was a couple of years before. And okay. then, yeah, I, and then, I, 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 and then, yeah. And it was, it, it was, and then I think I'd written it just before, I'd written a lyric with that line in it, and it was just before Exterminator was released. And then, that was 1999, and then I guess we toured Exterminator through 2000, and then in 2001, we recorded a track, the Kevin Shields mix it, and then we, we played it a couple of times, and then... When, when did September the 11th happen? 2001. Two, two, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then that happened, right? The Sony was just saying, we, we can't release the song, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, and it was just like, oh, well, what can you do? But it was, maybe it was predictive, you know? <laughs> you're, you're intuitive. You're an intuitive I artist. Know. I don't know. You, well, I don't know. I was... Um... I, have to, I have to jump in. He wasn't as predictive as... Dick Cheney, who in about the early 70s said, <laughs> we need it? a, hang on, we need a Pearl Harbor in the sky. Hello, I'm not pointing my finger <laughs> and the gun is loaded. I'm just saying. And then, and then, of course, and then, and then Stockhausen's tribute year yeah. around the world was canceled because he's like, I can't compete with a performance like that. <laughs> I, think it was, I think Stockhausen said it was the greatest work of art. I actually felt the same way as, as he did, but, but you know, and, uh, I remember at the time thinking, how can we make music or write songs after that? Because how can you shock? Like Lydia, you know, you've been, you've done stuff that shocked people, you know, transgressive films and your performances. You know, it used to be shocking for the Sex Pistols to go on TV and say, fuck, right? And everybody would get upset, right? Or Jim Morrison gets his dick out, right? But no rock and roll band can... You can never match what, you know, in the last 20 years, 18, 19, you know, okay, last 19 years, you cannot match. Like my kids, when they were like 14 to 12, were watching ISIS execution videos in the school playground on their iPhones with their mates. A rock and roll band, you can't compete with that in terms of shock value. Well, excuse me, because, you know, I never set out to shock anyone anyway. I, was I know, just always, I know, but you know what but, I, mean. I know what you mean. I was always trying to tell the fucking truth. But the thing is, especially after something like that, our voices are more important because of course somebody, not, of course. so it's not about shocking. It's about trying to make sense out of the senselessness of, I'm going to say it, the patriarchal military industrial complex, war horrors, endless obsession with fucking murder genocide, my God is bigger than your God, money for oil, it goes on and on and on, and it's not getting any better. Actually, thank you fucking Trump for making everything much worse. The only thing he's done good is he hasn't started a war yet, but I'm surprised everybody hasn't warred against us. You know where the war is coming now? It's in America. The war is within our own boundaries, and he refuses to shut it down, and he's accelerating it. That's my album, Accelerator. After September the 11th, I think it was the whole, in Britain, they were showing every news channel. It was like a 24-7. Oh, yeah. Slow motion of the World Trade Center being uh, the planes crashed into the, the two buildings, right? Like an Andy Warhol film. That's what it was like. That's why rock music and art 
is needed more so in these times and of the political insanity. Absolute propaganda. And the propaganda was, and then every newspaper was, you know, and then Tony Blair was, we're going to go to war. Yeah. And it was suddenly, and then Muslims were the enemy. And I remember at the time I was re reading Society of the Spectacle, the Gay Debor book, and I was like, mm. My whole thing was critical thinking, and I was like, whoa, I've been reading Chomsky and stuff, but you know, in the late 90s. And so I was kind of praying for this moment. I was just trying to uh, look at it critically and, uh, and, and, and in a detached way. And, you know, like I had people, like, you know, friends, friends of mine, like really intelligent women, you know, like uh, run their own businesses and, you know, really good liberal thinking, good people saying to me, uh, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein can launch a, a chemical weapons attack in London and, you know, it will take 25 minutes for the, you know, for the for the missiles to hit London. And, you know, because this is the front page of the Evening Standard. And I'm saying, uh, this is all bullshit. This is lies. It's propaganda. You know, they're, they're saying this stuff so that you will allow your government to go to war. They're, they're creating hysteria and fear here and dread, and you get nothing to fear from Saddam Hussein. Absolutely, it works. Not. It the works. Thing is, the thing nothing is, to fear from the Tony Blair government and the George Bush government. Right. That's right, because right. it was secular. It's and not, by the way, get up, they wanted America to get out of their oil field, so we're going to blame them for shit we know they did not commit. This is the American way, though. You blame somebody else for your crimes. This is projection. The guilty are always suspicious. This is where we are now. Mohammed Atta was Saudi Arabian. Most of the the oh, yeah, uh, totally. Saudis, yeah, yeah. Saudis, yeah. Saudis, and, and we and we we see like a hundred billion dollar. You know, and they never trained, and also they never trained in a uh, in Iraq. They trained no, in fucking Florida. They were learning to fly planes in Florida. Of course, yeah, I know. We should have all listened to Hans Blix. This is this is why <laughs> art, music, is still and sex are still the and pleasure are still the ultimate rebellion against the bullshit we as individuals have to sort through every single day of our lives in order to not be completely contaminated by it and buried under the bullshit. So that's why we create. So Bubba, you were talking, you were talking before about doing like the posters early on for your gigs. Do you still do graphic artwork? Do you still do any, do you do any visual art? No, I kind of, I, I kind of uh, gave the art direct the record sleeves and the single sleeves. And I just can't, that's what I do. But I don't do any visual art. I've always did the record sleeves. Well, what, what did this year look for you before it all gets okay, shut down? Uh, well, I think we had 19 gigs at festivals. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Lined up in Europe in the summer and uh, ah. we just fell away, yeah. you know. And it was the 50th anniversary of Glastonbury and they had us playing there and that cancelled as well. And um, so, yeah, we lost a lot of work, but... You know, everybody else is losing work size. What can do, you, you do you have a preference in terms of uh, audience sizes? Do you like smaller rooms where you can really see the audience, or do you like the big sea uh, of, of fans at a festival? Uh, uh, well, we, it depends on the night, and it depends on the audience, and it depends how well the band plays. Yeah. You know, um, I don't really have any real preference, you know. I mean, I, I like, we did a concert hall tour of theaters around Britain three or four weeks uh, last December. That was incredible because everybody was really close to you and it was people who bought tickets to hear the band. Yeah. So they were fans of Primal Scream. Whereas when you play in the festivals, I think sometimes it's a little bit like a shopping centre, like a mall, like a shopping mall. You know, people can go to McDonald's, they can go to like H&M, they can go to, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, whatever, you know. And it's like go to Levi's, you know, and it's a bit like that at the festivals. I think they, people catch a little bit of each band or then they go to the bar. So it just it depends on the night, you know, and some nights you, you, you play at a festival audience and it's fantastic and they're really receptive. And um, so I, I'm just happy to get the work, to be honest with you. You know, Fair. it's like uh, paid work is good and um, <laughs> we like to play. We're a good band and we can deliver live. and. Um, We'll play anywhere, you know. Bobby, I, I want to ask you this. So we just were both on this poetry record by Franco uh, Berardi. Do you ever do spoken word? Do, would you ever, do you want to do spoken word? Are you working on a memoir? 
we have uh, I've got a rec- we have got, I've got a record coming out next year. Uh, there's a little bit of spoken word on the record, but it's it's quite small, you know. It's like um, but it was it was it's good to do, it, and I would like to do more, and I have got some ideas to do more, got some poetry, and um, which I don't I'm not sure would how it would work in a rock and roll song, but that's something I need to think about uh, another time but it's definitely in my in my mind that it's a possibility please talk to me about it any time you want to talk to me about it I still love John Cooper Clark and the fact that he was so bold and he's still good and he still looks exactly the same and he's still fucking magnificent you know spoken word there's not that much of it now there needs to be more of it right now in my that, opinion yeah well, I think so. And I, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed uh, speaking or narrating uh, Franco's words. Yeah. You know, that was, uh, I had to try and find a rhythm there. Like when I sing my own words, you know, you find a rhythm. And uh, and I found a rhythm. You know, I didn't, I, I never, I didn't uh, narrate uh, Franco's words to a beat. I just found a rhythm in the poem and uh, tried to lay it down. And um I really, I enjoyed it, you know. I would like to do it again, but maybe with my own words. And um... As, oh, I think that's what you need to do. Bobby, I just finished in quarantine an album with Tim's band, Grid, which is like an alt-out jazz-ish improv group where I'm reading a few of my pieces, a piece by Henry Miller, a piece by John Retchie, and a piece by David Warner Rowitz. And and I want to send this to you because this might inspire also your yeah, concept it. about spoken word because nice, this yeah. is done to music. It doesn't always have to be done to music, but I I, I think it will inspire you. And it's like a yes. travelogue of the New York that once existed. Uh, okay. Yes, I would love to hear that. Okay. I've been so happy to talk to you. We have such a weird but connective tissue on this podcast, but we have kind of things that have weaved in and out that have connected us. And here we are again. And thank you so much, Bobby. No, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. And I'm going to be sending you that and we're going to be more in touch. And I'm going to be the cattle prod for your, <laughs> your po- I'll, I'll be the poker for you. you know? I love poking people for uh, your poetry okay. of spoken word. All okay. Right. Much love, my friend. And you take care. Bye. Take care, baby. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.